تحية محبي بحلقة اليوم استضفت عبر سكايب الأخت هدية مسلمة إيرانية سابقة هدية تحدثت عن تجربتها الخاصة مع حياة التدين والأسباب التي دفعتها إلى الانتقال من مذهب إلى مذهب ومن ثم ترك الإسلام واعتناق المسيحية أخت هدية بيسعدني اليوم أنه أستضيفك ببرنامج بلا قيود أهلا وسهلا فيك Thank you. I am so happy and honored to be with you here today. أختي تربيتي بعائلة مسلمة إيرانية. هل ممكن تخبريني شوي عن نشأتك وأجواء عائلتك؟ Sure. My parents are both um, Iranians, Persians, and they came in the 1960s to live in the United States. My father was studying to be a physician, and he got accepted to continue his education in the United States, and they left with fifty dollars in their pocket. and came to live the American dream. They were so excited. They left everything they knew and loved uh, to come to the United States. And that's really the way they raised us. They raised us as Americans. We were secular. They were not religious people at all. And so we spoke English in the home. Uh, we didn't have any religious practices at all. And the only thing we celebrated, if people are familiar with Persian culture, is the Persian New Year, Noruz. But other than that, Uh, they, uh, I didn't identify with being Persian except that my parents and some family members spoke Persian. قلتي شيء أخت هدية استوقفني أهلك كانوا حابين يعيشوا الحلم الأمريكي شو كان مفهوم هيدا الحلم بتفكيرهم عن شو كانوا عم يفتشوا لما هاجروا للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية Honestly the way they describe it was economic prosperity freedom to be able to make wealth that they couldn't make in Iran in a way in which they were free to live their lives uh, without fear of persecution. You know, it was during the time of the Shah, it wasn't during the Islamic Republic, but even during the Shah's time, there was always this fear of the, you know, the secret police and how you would live your life and whether it would be monitored or whether you were at risk. And so they just, they wanted to come to America. كيف أثر هالشيء عليكي؟ عشتي كمسلمة بعائلة تعتبر نفسها إنه حققت الحلم الأمريكي. Well, you know, interestingly enough, until I was six years old, until the Islamic Revolution in Iran, I had the most extraordinary life. But when the Islamic Revolution hit, and all there was a massive influx of uh, Iranian kids to Beverly Hills, I suddenly got, you know, and then there was the hostage crisis. So I was bullied and ridiculed at school and suddenly I became an Iranian. So from like one week to the next, I was an American kid and then I became an Iranian kid. And that, that was hard because I actually didn't even understand why they were saying that to me. And that part was really difficult. That adjustment period was difficult. And I think it called into question my identity early on And I think it was, it's probably the roots of what made me search for Islam as I grew older. It, it, it really came to, into focus for me when I fell in love with a boy in high school. And when we were graduating and we were going to college, we talked about getting married and we mentioned it to his parents and he was from a Jewish family. I was 17. And his mother flipped out. He's like, are you kidding? You can't marry a Muslim girl. That is absolutely unacceptable. Don't even talk that way. And I was devastated. I thought, first of all, I didn't even understand why she was calling me a Muslim. And it was, it was earth shattering to me. And at that point I realized, wow, this is, there's really this gaping hole in my life, in my identity. And so I think that's what really catapulted me into uh, searching for religion or relationship with God. So I went to my father and I basically told him what happened and he gave this very simple example. He said, uh, my daughter, it's my love, you are, he always calls me love. I encourage you to go pursue your own culture because it's the only place you're ever going to feel accepted. And that definitely stuck with me. I tried to explore other kind of new age philosophies, but he was right, it, it never felt like it fit. And so Islam seemed like the natural choice. And then of course, I fell in love with a Muslim boy. And so it was, it seemed like the logical choice. And I started to go to this mosque uh, that he went to, and it was actually uh, a very bad experience. Why was the experience 
It was a very extreme mosque in the sense that they promoted this takeover of the United States and turning it into a Muslim country, and it was extremely anti-Semitic. And I'm a Beverly Hills kid, and despite my negative personal experience, all my friends were Jewish. I, I had a love for Jewish people. I grew up around the culture since I was, you know, three years old. So I, I didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't sit with me at all. I actually despised it. And so I thought, well, if this is Islam, then I want nothing to do with it. And one thing led to another, and I met the Sufi community. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it's a much more, yeah. it's a much more mystical interpretation of Islam, and it was about uh, perfecting of the self and finding a personal relationship with God, and I felt, I felt really at home in that community, and it, it really gave me what I thought to be the relationship with God that I was looking for. Well, I, it, first of all, a lot of people I know don't believe that Sufism is part of Islam, but I converted to Islam and was part of a Sufi school of thought, basically. And so I had to recite the testimony of faith, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and then I accepted Islam. And I was actually quite devout. I, I kept wudu, the ritual praying, I prayed five times a day. I wore traditional Islamic clothing. I had a hijab. I, I didn't show any part of my skin except my face, my hands, and my feet. And I did this for 22 years. لكن شو تعلمتي من القرآن أختي دي؟ شو كانت تجربتك الدينية الحقيقية؟ هل تعلمتي تعليم القرآن؟ هل كان في حدا يعلمك؟ هل كنتي منتمية لجامع معين؟ أو كيف عشتي كيف عشتي معتقداتك الإسلامية؟ Oh, absolutely. I was uh, under the tutelage of, of several sheikhs learning Islam, and I studied um, fiqh and uh, the traditional Islamic law, and I studied Islamic jurisprudence. I read the Quran. I read other books. I sat in sermons. I watched videos. I was very, very steeped in understanding uh, the, the basic principles and the understanding and the advanced principles of what it meant to be a Muslim, and tazkiyat nafs so in Arabic, it's tazkiyat nafs the study of the purification of the self. And that was an additional discipline on top of the sharia of Islam. قلت إنك عشت سنين طويلة كمتعبد صوفي وأمضيت سنوات من التعلم على يد شيوخ ومعلمين مختلفين هل هيدي التعليم عطتك السعادة يلي كنت عم تفتشي عنها أو أحساس بالسلام أو شعور بنفسك بمعنى صرت تعرفي مين أنت؟ شو غيرت الصوفية بحياتك الداخلية؟ It brought nothing but fear, actually, because I had lived what would have been described as a very sinful life, and so when I came into Islam and I learned the Sharia, it was very, it was heavy on me. I felt like I could never do enough, and I tried harder, and I fasted longer, and I would fast on, you know, the voluntary days throughout the week. And for the voluntary holidays, I did a dhikr. Uh, I did 10,000 Allahs a day, 500 salawats on the Prophet. I did, I recited Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falak, Surah Al-Nas over and over and over again every single day. And it just, there was this constant feeling of dread that God would never forgive me for the sins I continued to commit and that I committed in the past. I would pray, I would cry to God. I never heard him speak to me. I never heard him respond. I never felt a sense of comfort. So it was natural for me to stay, but there was always this fear and almost a depression that I would never achieve what I had hoped to achieve, which was paradise. طرحتي مشاعر اليأس والخوف على مصيرك الأبدي مع الشيوخ. All the time. شعورك إنك ناقصة ومنك كفوقة هل حكيتي عن هذه المشاعر معهم؟ All the time. شو كان الجواب؟ It was, you do the best you can. You, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, he'll forgive you. But he, they never could promise me salvation. They don't. Muhammad never does. Uh, it was, it's not part of Islamic law that you could do certain things and be guaranteed. طيب ليه برأيك الناس مستعدين يسلموا حياتهم بثقة ويسلموا مصيرهم الأبدي طالما ما في أي ضمان للجنة أو السماء أو ما في ضمان إنه خطاياهم راح تنغفر؟ Honestly, I don't know why we do that. I mean, people ask me that all the time. Why did you stay? And I, 
I have no explanation except, I don't know, my entire social structure, all my friends, everything in my life revolved around Islam. So to leave seemed impossible. لي برأيك أخت هدية المرأة يعني التي تكون الزوجة الثانية أو الثالثة وهي تعرف أنه حقوقها مسلوبة ولا سيما شعورها بالمساواة وحريتها وعدم قدرتها أنه تعيش الحميمية الآمنة مع زوجة دون شعور بالتهديد والإهمال لي رغم كل هيدا الإشحاف بحقة المرأة تقبل بالأمر بتعدد الزوجات وأحيانا نرى المرأة المسلمة تدافع عن حق الرجل في تعدد الزوجات Well, the problem is again, the problem, the, the rules in Islam that say a man can take four wives, for example, again, a woman is told that this is what God wants and that this is what God allows in order to bring other women who wouldn't otherwise get married into a, a marriage. And you're, you're manipulated into believing that this would be, would be just, they say the Quran says, that they, he must bring justice between all four wives, but there is never justice between the four wives, especially in a Western country where it's illegal. So your, your marriage would never be registered and you're basically a mistress. And when the man is through with you, he can throw you out with no rights for your child no economic rights to separation. It's not, there's no community property issues like we have in the United States because you're not legally a wife. And so there are thousands of women around the Western countries, United States, Europe, who are devastated because they allowed a, a man to, to tell them that this was, or, and to believe that it was God through a man saying that this was acceptable and yet they have, they're left devastated with no lives and no fathers for their children. It's a really, it's a really destructive uh, system and it's, it's absolutely horrible for women. اسمحي لي اسالك اخت هديه بوقت من الاوقات لبستي اللباس الاسلامي والان ملابسك عاديه، هل كانت نظرتك لنفسك عم تتغير بحسب ملابسك؟ يعني هل شعرتي انك انسانه افضل؟ هل شعرتي انك اكثر طهاره مثلا عندما ارتديتي اللباس الاسلامي؟ وهل اعطاكي هيدا الشعور رضا عن نفسك؟ The thought that the clothing makes you good or bad is the most ridiculous thing in the world to me. Because now that I'm in a relationship with Christ, he's, first of all, loves me like his daughter. And it is a relationship built on love and on trust. And it's not about my clothing. It's really, it's so important for women to understand that your relationship with God cannot revolve around clothing. I remember one of the, the pivotal moments of why I left Islam is that when I took my head cover off, I was at the FBI, I was at headquarters, and I decided to take my head cover off. And all of these people started to tell me, oh, you're for sure going to hell now. لحظة أخت هدية، فاجأتيني بأشياء كثير دفعة وحدة، هل بفهم منك يعني إنه تركت الإسلام، أصبحتي مسيحية وإنك اشتغلتي مع الـ FBI؟ وإذا كان خيار الـ FBI أو عملك مع الـ FBI هو خيار مهني لي تركت الإسلام ولي تحولت إلى المسيحية يعني عم أحاول أفهم شو صار معك بالتحديد So uh, my, in my professional career I was a uh, federal contractor so I worked for various branches of the US government At the highlight of my career I was appointed to FBI headquarters to help develop a counterterrorism program for 52 field offices across the country. And I decided to take my head cover off, not because anybody told me, but because I just, I felt it would be a lot more comfortable to do my job. And that's when it just, Islam unraveled. It, Islam unraveled for me at that point. And I literally felt that God was, whoever God was, was extracting me, was taking me out of whatever it was that I currently believed. And I even told my friends, I did not understand it. I hadn't met Christ yet. I just told my friends, I have to leave. I can't explain it to you, but I know I have to leave. And I didn't know what that would entail. I didn't know what my relationship with God was at that time, but I knew I was leaving Islam. شو يلي خلاكي تحسي انه لازم تتركي، لازم تتركي، شو شو هو الغلط يلي خلاكي تحسي انه لازم تتركي الاسلام و شو حرك فيكي هيدا الاحساس؟ It was it was when I uh, when I took my head cover off, I just it, the religion unraveled. 
because it was, I was told that I was gonna hang from my hair for an eternity in hellfire because I took my head cover off. So no matter what else I did, it didn't matter. And that God was for sure gonna damn me into an eternity in hellfire for this one act. شو كانت أفكارك عن الله بهالوقت؟ كيف كنتي تفهمي الله؟ والإله بده يعذبك للأبد بس لأنك مش لابسة غطاء الرأس؟ The thought that God would do that to me after all that I had worshipped, I just decided that he was, this was interesting. I trusted that God was good, but this religion was unreasonable. I believed, I, I tell people, even as a Christ follower, that I've always loved God. I just didn't know who he was. So I wasn't angry at God. I wanted nothing to do with this religion of Islam. And so I left Islam. I didn't leave who I, who I wanted to find out who God really was. And so when I came, I moved to California. I sold all my possessions. Uh, I sold my home. I left my community. Very, very difficult. I lost all my friends. They treated me like I was dead. And I moved to California, back to where my family was, where my parents are. And I was back into the same kind of crazy lifestyle I was uh, before I came to Islam. And that made me even more miserable, that all this devotion that I had done in Islam was literally like a cage. And I flew out of the cage as soon as the door was opened and I fell right back into this empty lifestyle where nothing brought me joy. And I would just kept crying to God, who are you and where are you? كل هالأزمات بحياتك أغتدية وكأنه في دائرة مسكرة مغلقة عم تحاولي تلاقي السعادة وتلاقي نفسك ولكن مش قادرة أول شيء حسيتي أنك رفضتي من قبل أصدقائك اليهود شعرتي أنك مرفوضة من المسلمين لأنه تركتي اللباس الإسلامي وشعرتي أنه الله بسهولة بيحكم عليك بنار جهنم لأجل طريقة لبسك ومع هيك عم تفتشي عن الله ليه ما فكرتي بسهولة مثلا أنه الله مش موجود؟ Because I knew it I knew, I always knew, despite all of the, I mean, of course I can tell you the answer now as a Christ follower is that God was always calling me. He was calling me the whole time. I just didn't know who he was, but yet he was going to have me walk through this road and have all of these experience, experiences. So one, I'd be able to help others who are, who are still in Islam find the love of Christ, but that he was leading me towards him. So I left uh, Washington, D.C., moved to California, and again, my life was in shambles at some point. I had, a, I had a great business and a great personal relationship, and then that was destroyed, and I found myself back into this terrible, um, self-destructive lifestyle and crying to God to reveal himself to me and I find this video of a pastor on YouTube posted from a tweet of a girl I don't even know. She basically says, I'm having all of these personal trauma. I watched this pastor and he helped me a lot. Why don't you listen? And so I was struck by how beautiful the message was, how passionate this pastor was about Jesus Christ. And I thought, this is fantastic. I started to binge watch him. I watched video after video after video. And I was saying to myself, well, this is interesting. So Jesus is coming to help me solve my problems. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that Jesus was God coming to solve my problems. It was like Jesus the prophet was coming as my understanding in Islam was. And then it was weeks, if not months, that I was praying to God, totally confused at this point, because I didn't understand who Jesus was in relation to this God that I had lost a relationship with. And so I was crying to God to reveal himself to me. And it was in one of these prayers in my bedroom that I audibly heard the voice of Jesus Christ say, Hedia, it's me. And it was earth shattering. I cried, I was trembling, I was shocked. And I just kind of sat there and I spent the next several weeks figuring out what in the world I was going to do with the fact that Jesus was God. كيف عرفتي هدية مين يلي عم بقول لك هيدا أنا ولكن إلا هيدا الوقع أو المعنى بنفسك؟ 
Well, because I've been spending the past, I'd, I'd spent months asking God to reveal himself. I'm listening to a Christian pastor talk about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that he died on the cross and was resurrected again for us to be forgiven of our sins and that we would have eternal life. That one thing I was searching for, eternal life, for salvation, for living in eternity with God. And then I had all this knowledge of who Jesus was in the Quran and I was totally confused, but I held on to God and I said, God, can you reveal yourself to me? Is this your son? What am I, what am I feeling right now? Why am, I, why am I feeling drawn to you as Jesus Christ, as your son, as my savior? I don't understand, will you reveal yourself to me? And it took weeks, it took weeks until I heard the voice and so when I heard the voice, I knew exactly what he meant. I mean, those were the only words I needed because he knew the deepest confusion, the, the key to me being in relationship with him was telling me that he was God. I cried, I panicked, I freaked out. I didn't know what I was going to do because I thought people would come and kill me if they found out. And how can I be a, you know, a, a polytheist worshiping multiple gods? I didn't, it was my heart and my spirit knew the answer, but my mind was wrestling with what this would mean. And I spent more time and more weeks trying to read uh, the Bible, and then the Bible came alive. The, the living word of God came alive in a way the Quran never did. And I never understood, it never spoke to my heart. It was just a bunch of stuff, words on a page I was trying to memorize. But the Bible came alive. It all made sense. And then in prayer, repeated, I spent so many countless hours in prayer and I heard the Lord say to me, daughter, you do not have to be afraid. And that was it. That was all I needed. I went to the church in North Carolina of the first pastor that I had originally saw the video from and was, uh, was baptized. Saat, يعني قلتي من الصلاة. سمعتي صوت الرب. اكتشفتي إنه الكتاب المقدس كلمة حية. هل وصلتي للاكتفاء والشبع اللي كنت عم تفتشي عليهم؟ هل حققتي شعور بالهوية وسلام النفس؟ Oh, meeting Jesus Christ was, was the first encounter I ever really had with God. I felt like he was calling me my whole life, my whole, uh, ever, ever since I can remember as a teenager, the void that was empty and he was calling me and he was calling me and I just kept, I kept taking a wrong turn. I kept taking a wrong turn or at least what I thought was a wrong turn. And then when I finally meet him, I, I knew it. I knew I had met him. And people are like, oh, you're just jumping from religion to religion. I was like, no, God called me and walked me this entire road so that I can reach back and help bring his sons and daughters back. If I didn't have the experience that I have in Islam and the knowledge of all the things that are missing in Islam and all the things that are wrong in Islam and how Christ our Lord and Savior makes them right, how would I be able to help others? All the years I spent in Islam, in, in strict discipline, I mean, I, was, I, was, I, I had the discipline of a soldier in following Islam, did nothing to change who I was. It was not until I met the risen savior that he literally transformed my life, my heart, my thoughts, the way I behave, my, he, and it's not like he, he threw away what I was, he just made it better. He just made it, um, he just brought joy and peace. He put, he put all the parts of my life back together. He forms, he continues to form me into the identity that I was supposed to be all along. حكيتي اختي دي انه كان عندك مخاوف كثير لما كنتي مسلمه وانه كنتي تعملي كل شيء من من خوف، هل انتهت مخاوفك؟ in Islam, I did everything out of fear of a God that stood somewhere off in the distance that I had no real relationship with. And now with Jesus, I do everything because I love him. 
he has entirely transformed my entire existence. And I follow him because I love him and because he loves me. هل عندك كلمة بتحب توجهيها للناس اللي عم يسمعوك اليوم؟ كتار رح يدينوكي البعض يمكن يصدق قصتك البعض الآخر يمكن يقول إنه ما كنت بتعرفي أي شيء عن الإسلام الحقيقي لهيك تركت دينك شو بتقولي؟ People say to me all the time, oh, you you actually didn't understand Islam, and I, it makes me chuckle because it is actually my very deep understanding of Islam that helps me to know who Jesus Christ really is. And I, I, at the end of the day, whenever I get into conflicts with Muslims about this and, and we talk about the true nature of Jesus Christ, I tell them, I said, listen, I, I don't, you don't have to believe me. Ask God. For those that are, you know, because Muslims really believe that they're worshiping God, I said, sit down in prayer. Make sajda. Ask God to reveal his son to you. I said, and, and he will show up. When you ask with an open heart to reveal his son he will do it. And I, and I, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's God that does the transformation, not me. I, I can plant the seed, others can water it, but it's up to, it, it's up to God to decide to open somebody's heart. And I, I, what I like to call attention to people to is how much of the divinity of Christ Muslims already accept. In other words, they believe in a virgin birth. Muslims believe in a virgin birth. So Jesus came to an existence without a father, um, without an earthly biological father. Then they believe he ascends. He, so Christ in Islam ascends up to the heavens to, to be with God. And then he will descend. So it's not just the miraculous encounter of him going up to the Lord into the heavens, but he comes back in the last days to fight the Antichrist, to fight the Dajjal. I said, so basically, so who's on the cross? Because they believe that there was a person that looked like Christ on the cross. They said, well, that was Judas. And I said, well, how is it Judas? They said, well, Allah took his soul out and put Judas' soul. And I said, listen to me. I beg of you. Just, just listen to yourself say that. That it was a virgin birth. Christ was of a virgin birth. He performed countless miracles, which Muslims all accept. He ascends, he descends, but he's not the one on the cross? So why would God go through all that trouble? Why would he lay out the divinity of this human being, of this God-man for you, and then make some kind of weird uh, person's soul transformation on the cross? He said, don't you understand? He's trying to tell you, even in Islam, even in the book that you, be that you believe, that he is God. And I, I just try to plant that seed in their minds for them to really think commonsensically about who they think Jesus Christ is. And at the end of the day, they have to pray and ask God to reveal his true identity to them. Shukran ala kalimatik al-sadqa wal miliyani na'mi ukht hadiyya. Wa shukran ala wa'atik. Rabbi barik hayatik. Amen, I hope so. Thank you. Fi uwit ta'thir bi risalit al-injil aktar bi-kteer mimma fina nifham. Lama mnisma risalit al-injil bi qalb maftuh, Allah bi-khlaq fina shi yali mish mumkin uwi aw balaga min al-mutakallim aw al-wa'iz t'qdar t'khlaq. Wa huwa l-eeman ala asas al-fida. الإيمان بالفداء يعني نعمة الغفران والحب الإلهي المجاني بيدفعونا بقوة عمل الروح القدس أنه نسلم نفسنا للمسيح والتجديد يلي منختبره بعمل الروح القدس فينا أساس طاعة المسيح يلي بتخلق رغبة الالتزام بقلوبنا وبتغيرنا حتى نصير نشبه طبيعة المسيح وأما كل الذين قبلوه فأعطاهم سلطانا أن يصيروا أولاد الله أي المؤمنون بسمه